That's why uh, she likes score. Now, back to my workout. Capture the magic of the holiday season with a special gift from Woodward's. Flute champagne glasses offer a special toast to the festive season. Mealtime is made easy with a brawn food processor. Stimulating and oh so reasonable. Simulated pearls for Christmas. You'll never miss your favorite show with this Toshiba VCR. You're one step closer to your own bistro with a cappuccino maker. The best of the Christmas season just for you from Woodward's. It's the Lions and the Ticats in the Grey Cup, 10.30 Sunday on BCTV. Thomas Niles is the United States ambassador to Canada. He's only been here a couple of months. He is described as a cool pro, a professional diplomat in a very tender and sensitive job in a country where we get uptight over the slightest dropped remark. You're going to meet Mr. Niles this morning. And shortly on the program, you're going to meet, we can't do a day without talking about Lyle Island, you're going to meet Miles Richardson of the Haida Nation. And with him is James Gosnell of the Nishka Tribal Council. And we shall attempt to get out clearly and simply what their aims are on Lyle Island. When an order of the court says that the Lyle Island logging must be allowed to go ahead. But first, the ambassador, Thomas Niles, after the break. Probably, probably too early to know, but I must ask Mr. Thomas Niles, the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, what kind of feeling he has this morning about the success or otherwise of the summit talks with Gorbachev? Well, uh, with the proviso that I've only read about it in the press, uh, listened to uh, reports on television, I think it went quite well. More or less what we expected. I think it was a successful meeting. Nothing, successful first step. Yeah, the first step. Nothing dramatic, nothing sensational. But when people are chatting and laughing together, things always seem better, don't they? Well, I don't think you want to make too much out of that. But uh, it is a good first step in a process. I gather that the president, uh, Gorbachev, agreed that Gorbachev will visit the uh, United States next year and the president will be going to the Soviet Union in 1987. So we have a process going here. You were preceded in your position by a very colorful political type ambassador, my description, Paul Robinson. And yet, you hadn't been long in this country before you came out with a, a suggestion up here, which, uh, which up here caused people to put up their eyebrows, that we should consider voluntarily cutting our lumber exports to the United States as a measure of some kind of self-help. People nearly fainted when they heard that. We've got to ship every stick of wood we can in our winter of discontent in the forest industry. What kind of reaction did you get from that? Or have you changed your position on that at all? Well, I, I got a very negative reaction to, to that. Uh, I, I gather that I was criticized in the Canadian Parliament uh, for being uh, uh, out, of, out of place, uh, saying something which uh, was, uh, in a sense, uh, an invitation to collusive behavior on the part of uh, Canadian companies, which it certainly wasn't. All, all I said uh, was that, uh, if your number one market is uh, going through some trouble and uh, in, in a difficult state, you ought to take a look at what people are saying down there and see whether you can work things out with them. And in other words, you are warning us that the strength of the rise of protection, protectionism in the lumber industry would be made even stronger because of our pushing exports all the time to the states. We in the United States uh, have a difficult situation in the uh, wood products, forest products industry, which I gather is analogous to the situation which you have, for example, here in British Columbia and other parts of uh, Canada where timber industry is, is very important. And uh, my own feeling, and I think also the feeling of my government in, in Washington, is that we ought to sit down and see if we can work these problems out jointly. Uh, we, uh, we understand that uh, there are uh, difficulties in your forest products industry, that unemployment is high in British Columbia, and we certainly don't want to be part of your problem. 
But we have a problem, too, and I think as good neighbors and good trading partners, we ought to be able to sit down and try to work this thing out and see whether, whether there's some solutions that work for you and work for us. But we, what is the climate, though, of protectionism now? I'm not talking about overall free trade. I'm talking about how we learn about how the American interests very properly say, these Canadians are cheating. These Canadians are subsidized through stumpage. These Canadians have get much government help, and we great free enterprises have to compete on the open market with timber we buy. Is it strong enough to enforce either countervailing duties or excise duties or more uh, imposts on our export? No, I, I think, frankly, that uh, you're, you're right on the one hand that there's a lot of pressure in the industry in the United States, and there's pressure from the congressman, members of Senate and House of Representatives. Sam, what's his name? Uh, well, Mr. Senator, uh, Congressman Gibbons is right. not from a timber area. He's from Florida, but uh, uh, he is uh, concerned about raw materials pricing, and he has some legislation uh, before the Congress. I personally don't think that the Congress will adopt legislation of the sort that uh, Congressman Gibbons has, has proposed, certainly not this year. The President has indicated that he will veto protectionist legislation, and the bill which passed the Congress recently, the House of Representatives recently on textiles, did not have a sufficiently large majority in passage to uh, indicate that it, a presidential veto could be overridden, that is to say that you'd have two-thirds plus one. So I'm pretty confident myself that the President will be able to control protectionism in the United States, but the best way to deal with these problems, it seems to me, is uh, for the two countries, as we've always done in the past, to sit down and see whether we can find some solutions to Are you it. talking about the overall free trade uh, negotiations, which are... Well, I'm talking about both. Uh, we do propose next year to uh, take up the uh, free trade negotiate or negotiations on a freer trading environment, uh, proposed by the Prime Minister, welcomed by the President. Uh, at the same time, we uh, should, I believe, continue to discuss separately some of the uh, difficult issues, timber one of them, fish products another, uh, some problems we have with investments in Canada, so that uh, the, the, you, you don't lose time in trying to find a solution. Mind you, things, things are much happier for the American investors since the election of the Conservative government, which is much easier to deal with than the question of investment in Canada, is it not? We've resolved some uh, problems in the investment area. Uh, I would say that the most difficult set of issues we had to deal with over the last, uh, say, five years was in the energy area as a result of some of the uh, uh, some aspects of the uh, national energy program. And those aspects are being revised. Some of them have already been revised. So yes, in that particular area, we have uh, fewer problems. And uh, the change in emphasis uh, from FIRA to Investment Canada. Uh, an, o an opener approach to foreign investment has certainly uh, resulted in a better environment, better atmosphere. A uh, little American trivia for me, please, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, in the United States, you must be a U.S. citizen, must you not, to own a radio station, a television station. Is that correct? Uh, you must be a United States citizen in order to control a radio station or a television station. It does not apply, interestingly enough, to cable television, which, of course, may be the sort of the wave of the future. Who knows? Uh, Tell me, is there a considerable sensitivity still in the United States on how we wiped out the revenue for the border stations on television? We continue to feel that uh, the uh, border broadcasting uh, provisions were uh, a bad idea, and uh, we would be delighted should the government of Canada choose to uh, change those regulations. But we, in our wisdom, have gone ahead and, and uh, introduced analogous legislation in the United States so that uh, uh, you did something which we consider to be uh, ill-advised, so we went ahead and did the same thing. Tit for tat. Uh, well, Tit for tat you know, legislation. That's kind of true. childish, isn't it, between well, two uh, grown boys? I, I, would, uh, won't, I don't want to accuse the Canadian government of doing something childish. I think our response may have been It something. must be very tricky to be a diplomat, isn't it? Well, it's a lot of fun. Now, how, what about our cultural sovereignty? You're aware of our incredible culture, our sensitivity in cultural sovereignty. And here, Gulf and Western have bought by accident a Canadian publishing of Prentice Hall. Now, you wouldn't want us to give you permission to own publishing companies or newspapers or banks or radio or television stations in Canada. You wouldn't think that would be good, would you? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I think we ought to be fairly uh, balanced in terms of uh, what one country's nationals can do in the other country. So to the extent that uh, Canadian companies can buy and operate publishing companies and newspapers in the United States, 
I would personally not consider it to be totally outrageous to suggest that uh, United States interests might own publishing companies in Canada. But really, I see, of course, that we're the flea on the back of the elephant and that we're already totally impregnated with all American cultural spheres. You must leave us some for ourselves. Well, I don't accept that analogy, flea and elephant. You know, you have to be a little bit more self-confident. Mouse and elephant. No, I think even that uh, is, a, this is, a, this is really a, putting yourself down, really. Uh, oh, come now, 25 no, so million, 250 million. Well, you these numbers, of, these numbers you don't count. and we get pneumonia. I wouldn't pay too much attention to the numbers. I mean, after all, there's 750 million Indians or a billion Chinese. I mean, you don't worry too much about these numbers. My feeling is that, uh, uh, there's a strong uh, dynamic uh, Canadian identity today, which is not, I'm learning more about it every, every time I travel in Canada, and uh, I don't think it's been attenuated or weakened by the fact that you trade uh, with the United States and live next door to us. I mean, there is some sharing back and forth, no question about it, and there may be a little bit more from the United States coming to Canada than vice versa, but I don't think that it's weak in Canada or in any way weak in Canadian culture. You don't find any anti-Americanism in this country at all, do you? I find uh, people in this country who quite reasonably question some of the things that we're doing. There are lots of people in the United States who question things we're doing. Except we're not. We talk about flea and the elephant. You can go down to parts of the states today, I'm sure, where they can barely spell the name Canada. And that's not their fault. It's our fault, isn't it? Well, I don't know who's at fault. It's a pity that we don't know more about Canada and the United States. Canadian kids always know the name of the President of the United States, and they don't know the name of the Prime Minister of Canada because we're so overwhelmed by your media influences. Oh, no, I don't think our media influences could possibly have any impact on what children in Canada know. I mean, there, I doubt that children in the United States, unfortunately, yeah. would know that Brian Mulroney is the Prime Minister of Canada, and I hope we can change that. I mean, some do, not, but too few do. And Thomas Niles, U.S. Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador to the United States. No, well, to Canada. To Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult to say U.S. Ambassador. That to sounds Canada. great. Say it again. Reagan's man. <laughs> okay, Reagan's like man it. in Ottawa. That's, That's better, it. There isn't you it? go. Okay, I'm going to try some phone calls to the ambassador and a few more questions from me. If you want to talk to him, now be respectful. He's a diplomat. After the break. I don't really know how to introduce prof interview professional ambassadors, but one thing that annoyed me uh -oh. was this question of Arctic sovereignty. Why you had to push your way through the Arctic when we know perfectly well it's our Arctic? And when, if the Americans have free access to the Arctic, so do the Russians. Well, now wait, yeah, you have to get the terminology right here. I don't mean to correct you, but... Please, feel free. And the important thing is it's not Arctic sovereignty. We're not questioning sovereignty over the Arctic. We're questioning one very specific strait that runs through the Arctic. So it's the Northwest Passage where the area or the, the distance between the headlands where you draw the lines is such that it does not, as we see, as we read the laws, does not fall within territorial waters. And that's the only thing we're quarreling about or discussing, and we've been discussing it for a long time. And we're continuing to discuss it, and we in Washington hope that we'll be able to work something out which will satisfy your interests and ours. Now, uh, I see I have a call. We're on a satellite to Ottawa, and I see I have a call here from Ottawa. Oh, my. And I suspect it's from an NDP MP. And I don't know what he's going to ask you, but he can have a bash at you. Okay, fine. Who is it? Jim Fulton. Morning, Jack. How are you today? Just a minute before you talk to the ambassador. Uh, did uh, Robinson really get ripped over the coals yesterday by Broadbent when Broadbent said he was not to go back up to Lyle Island again? No, he didn't, Jack. But I certainly have a few questions that I'd like to put to your to, to your next guests uh, regarding what's going on on Lyle Island. Why would you ask him about Lyle Island? Well, I think uh, there's uh, there's an awful lot of. Uh, very narrow information going out uh, across the airwaves regarding Lyle Island. And Mr. Fulton, think, Mr. It, Fulton, if you want... more broadly addressed, Jack. If you want to talk to me or come on the program about Lyle Island, you're more than welcome. I've invited you a couple of times, but you and I can't seem to get together. I'm but glad I, to come on, Jack, and uh, well, I'll, please I'll make come sure on. that in the next little while I come on, as long but as you give me an hour. I, I'll give you what the, the story is worth, Mr. Fulton, but I don't think that you should attempt to involve the American ambassador this. If you'll phone back after the program, I'll make a date with you right away at the earliest possible date. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, I was just going to make a comment uh, to your guest. Uh, 
I think that there's uh, an awful lot of people in, in uh, Canada, and United States citizens and European citizens, uh, and I'm sure probably Soviet citizens, who are pretty, uh, pretty fed up with uh, the government spending as much money as they are in, in arms proliferation. And I would think that there's a different direction being taken by the Soviets uh, these days. And I would like to see that the uh, Americans, uh, uh, this guy's boss and, uh, and that administration, have a real good look at it. Uh, I think eventually you're going to have to deal with your deficit. Okay, question. That's the question. Here's the answer. Well, uh, the questioner seemed to be under the impression that uh, the Soviet Union is cutting back in defense spending when, in fact, the opposite is uh, taking place. The Soviet Union is continuing uh, what has been a massive defense buildup over the last uh, 20 years, and we see no signs that it's uh, d d diminishing. Uh, the president uh, is uh, dedicated to finding ways in which we can cut back on armaments, starting uh, with uh, the most threatening armaments, namely uh, land-based offensive nuclear missiles. And uh, we hope that this will be one of the consequences of the meeting in uh, Geneva. Go ahead to the ambassador. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, sir. I'd like to ask uh, the ambassador. Uh, in fact, I say that the ambassador. Hello. D hold on a second, please, and turn down your television set. Go ahead, please. Yes. Good morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, I have a question for your guest there. Uh, I was planning to retire uh, in the United States and uh, wanted to know the formalities of still retaining my Canadian citizenship. Uh, it's a simple immigration question, is it not, Mr. Ambassador? Well, uh, I don't think that living in the United States in retirement would have any impact at all on one's Canadian citizenship. I mean, you don't become an American citizen by living in our country unless you apply for citizenship, and I gather your caller doesn't intend to do that. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to know uh, what would happen to the trade uh, or the lumber uh, Exports? Yeah, if our, our, if our money was at a par, couldn't that wipe out any differences that they're um, talking about? It certainly would make a big difference, would it not, sir? Oh, I think one of the major factors in the in increase in Canadian lumber exports to the United States over the last five years has been the uh, decline in the value of the Canadian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar, no question about it. But it's been, a, of course, it's been a great advantage to us on the short haul because of the reduction of our dollar that gives us a competitive advantage in your market on both coasts, does it not? It does. It does give an advantage. And, of course, one of the uh, things that's, I think, uh, been advantageous from the Canadian point of view has been the upswing in home building in the United States, where we're up to about uh, 1.8 million units at an, on an annual basis now, which has created quite a bit of demand for lumber. Well, your unemployment States. has been decreasing quite steadily, has it not? Well, not in the timber area. I mean, our national unemployment rate is down to about 7.2, 7.3%. But in the timbering areas in the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, those areas, unemployment remains fairly high, as in BC. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. That's you. Yeah, OK. I and my, it isn't a question. My beef is that uh, the Alaska Panhandle rightfully belongs to Canada. Ha <laughs> <laughs> All right, but it does. <laughs> What's your question? Well, that's the question. When are we going to get it back? I want you to arrange that we get the Alaska Panhandle back this very day, Mr. Ambassador. That's a joke. Good. <laughs> I'll laugh with you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. The ambassador makes light of the... Uh, cultural effect of American uh, programming in Canada. Um, in my days, uh, the last letter in the alphabet in Canada was pronounced Z. But since Sesame Street, I can't find a child that pronounces it as Z. That's the effect that we have. So there is Comment on that. A very astute observation. It's just the intermingling of the two cultures with the common language, I suppose, it can't be avoided. Well, I, uh, I personally uh, like Sesame Street. I sometimes watch the program myself. I find it entertaining. Uh, I just can't believe that that program, though, has had that kind of an impact in Canada or, or anywhere else. But, it has. It definitely has. Well, is that a bad thing? Well, how do you expect to, us to retain our identity if that is the type of effect that comes about? Well, I personally wouldn't think of reducing the Canadian cultural identity down to the point of whether you say Z or Z. 
I mean, I think there are more important things here, and my feeling is that the Canadian identity is strong and well. The point well, I mean, that I'm trying to make is that the American culture does have that effect, and it has had that effect, and in spite of it, the Canadian programming development uh, has come about, and unless we have that protection, it will fade away. There is absolutely no intention, no question on our side of doing anything in terms of what you do on your own television networks. I mean, this is something that is certainly not a subject to negotiate in trade negotiations. But that is a this desire. Is the that, that of the flea and the elephant. Yeah, that's Thank a, you. I agree with them to some extent. For instance, let me give you a, a hypothetical question. Supposing the Toronto Blue Jays had won the baseball. I would have gone to the series. World Series. That would have been great. Yeah, you'd have gone to the World Series, but just imagine the, the, the cultural effect that would have had in the United States. It oh. might have destroyed Major League Baseball. Oh, I don't think so at all. It would have strengthened Major League Baseball. Did the Stanley Cup or did the National Hockey League go into a decline when the Islanders won the Stanley Cup? Well, it did here in Vancouver, I might well, tell you. <laughs> wait until the Capitals win it this year. They can never win it. Go ahead, please. <laughs> When I'm talking about my phones this morning. Go ahead, please. You got a dial tone there. I've got a dial tone there, too. Something's stuck here. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Oh, yeah. Hello? Yep. Good morning. Yes, uh, I was wondering how two of my uh, It would happen with the American ambassador here this morning. These damn things were sticking yesterday. Hello? And one of you speak up, please. Hello? Yes, you speak up. Okay, hi, Jack. Uh, not me? Yes, you. Okay, I'd just like to know, uh, like we have a, a, a thing on pay TV here on our pay TV station. It's called the Canadian Question. Uh -huh. And they ask questions like, what is a toot? Now, I've heard the most ignorant answers in my life. Oh, it's a Canadian house. <laughs> oh, it's an igloo. <laughs> it's kissing. So, I mean, we're, what's wrong with, uh, we would learn everything about the states. Don't you people learn anything about Canada? We don't live in igloos anymore. <laughs> we're not in the far north, eh? <laughs> Did you get the, the a, nuance yeah. of the a? a yeah. Mr. Ambassador, I think we've gone through enough of this this morning so far. I'm going to fix my phones when I take a break and regard this as a pleasantly informal introduction to you. You seem a very nice fellow. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be back with the phones fixed after the break. Six. Four. I have in the studio now, and I think we've solved the little problem we had with the telephone with the, when the ambassador from the United States was here, but I have in the studio now two of the principal Indian band leaders in British Columbia, and we're going to have a little exploration of the problems of Indian bands in BC at the moment. James Gosnell who is president of the Nishka Tribal Council. And you heard Tom Berger the other day explain how the Nishkas are the one major band who have won a land claim decision in court in uh, for British Columbia on a situation which has not yet been resolved, apparently, as I recall, because the provincial government won't negotiate on what's going to happen now that the decision has been given. Now. Here we have two, Miles Richardson, whom you know well from events on Lyle Island. And he is the, leads the Haida Council of Nations in the Queen Charlotte. Now, good morning, Miles. Council of the Haida Nations. Council of the Haida Nations. Good morning, Miles. Good morning, Jack. <laughs> right, we're, we're back in business again. Now. What's the score on Lyle Island this morning, if we may do that simply and first before we get down to the overall subject? Well, there's a lot of Haida people still on the island, still, I'm sure, resolved to uphold the position that our people have taken in regard to no logging on on the area that's come to be known as South Moresby. Uh, in fact, there was no trouble on the road this morning, and logging is continuing today, and neither you nor I have been able to get a clear explanation of it, have we? Well, you were apparently in touch with your reporter up there. I'm down here speaking to you right now. I'm not up there. Do you intend to continue to defy the injunction of the Supreme Court of British Columbia which says to you that the logging company must be allowed to continue? I think it's been very clear 
the position that our people have taken in regarding logging in that area. It's been an issue that's been very intensely discussed over the past 12 years. It's certainly an issue that's been around for well over a hundred years. And our people have worked very hard and very diligently through due process as defined by the federal and provincial governments which have not to date adequately put into their decision making mechanisms. Um, ways of dealing with the legitimate rights of our people. And, Why and choose Lyle Island? Lyle Island has been logged on and off and continuously now for 12 years. Well, Lyle Island is not the primeval forest and Lyle Island is part of TFL 24. Why choose Lyle Island now? Well, when our people look at development, development of our resources, development of our lands, we look at it in terms of our entire islands, the land, seas and resources of our islands. And o logging's been going on there for its... 100 years. About 71 odd years. It's, it's been increasing and the intensity of that logging as technology develops has been increasing. And our people have been very concerned about the rate of, of alienation of those resources. Is it not a and, fact? And its effect that it's having on, on our lands the lands that our culture, that our identity as a people is dependent on. But and that, that is why our people had decided that there were some areas of our islands that must be left intact. So it, wa it wasn't a last minute decision that we run in and, and decide to stop logging on Lyle Island. It was a very deliberate decision that was made over many years of discussion amongst our people. And we've worked very hard through, as I stated, the processes defined by the provincial government when they wouldn't respect us as the as the Haida people making decisions in our homeland we worked through those processes to try and make them work at every turn we were brushed aside do you want to stop all logging and uh, on places not yet logged in in the Queen Charlotte's South Moresby particularly. Do you want to stop all logging for the sake of the environmentalists who have been campaigning for that massive park? Is that what you want to do, to stop all logging? We've never ever stated that we wanted to stop all logging. Do you want the land totally turned over to you? We want to sit down with the applicable Canadian authorities, being the federal and provincial governments, and work out uh, agreements with them, with the peop for the people that they represent so that we can coexist productively in the rich lands that we both depend on. TFL 24 supplies logs and chips and whatnot to pulp mills. Do you want to close down the pulp mills and stop the logging there? The pulp mills are in no danger of closing down over the areas that we're talking about. Well, whether they are or whether they're not, what you have not made it clear to me is that you have chosen TFL 24 on Lyle Island as the place where you are going to stop all logging regardless. Is that right? Yes. Regardless of the courts. Well, I'd, like I said, Jack, our people had, had gone through and exhausted all of those processes very diligently how over the past, hide, over the past 12 of, years. How many hiders have worked for the logging companies in the Charlottes? Many hiders, and, and I know that a lot of our people intend to continue working in the logging industry and depending on the forest resource, and depending, but not in this particular area. How, in other words, you've, you've just, you, are you being a front for the environmentalists with their half million petition and don't raise the pyramids, the big ads? I think that's ridiculous. That's an argument that's been cooked up by you. Not cooked up by me. Well, that's, that's the impression that you're putting across to the public. The first mention of Lyle Island recently was from the Canadian Wildlife Federation and McCrory and the big ads, they're the people who initially wanted the park for the nation, is that correct? No, our people had decided that we were concerned about the management and use of the resources on our islands that our people depend on. You gotta remember that our people today are inheritors of a 10,000 year old Cultures, a culture that's existed from the beginning of time, a culture that depends on the land, seas, and resources of our territories. And we have to, we have to protect that. That's our responsibility. This is a, a new development as you become more politically aware of the situation with the, with the non-Indian governments. It's not a new development. Every 
generation of Haidas over the past 10,000 years has had that responsibility and has been successful in, in, in keeping our culture okay. going strongly. Right. What we need to do now is to sit down and coexist, sit down and work out agreements on coexisting with all of the other people with respect for the legitimate constitutional rights of our people and all other people. I know. How are you but we have to sit down and begin that. And you're doing this to force the federals and the provincials to sit down now and give you the land claims you want. Is that right? You, you have to remember that, that the rights that we're talking about, that the title that, it, that in, is a legal term it's put, put in, are legitimate legal rights in this country. They've been pushed aside for too long. And we have tried to make that process work. What we're talking about is justice. We are people. We are a culture. And we feel that the, the legitimate rights of our people can be respected and dealt with in the, within the confines, within the framework of the Canadian democracy. But in the we have to get on with that. In, in the absence of that, in the, you got to remember, it takes two to negotiate. We've been willing to for well over 100 years, and that was stated very clearly in the court case last week. And our survival depends on those lands and resources. It's come down to us having to protect those lands and resources to ensure that our people and our culture survives. It sounds very good with all due respect, but you're not facing the facts of life at the moment. You've got a federal government that's powerless to give you the land because it's Crown Provincial. Am I correct in that? I wouldn't say that they're powerless. I think that the, all of the political leaders in this country have a responsibility to, oh, I, I to operate by the principles that this country is formed agreed, on. Agreed, but you've got to face practical real, realities. The second question is, you have a provincial government which has steadfastly refused to recognize aboriginal rights or land claims. Is that correct? They've steadfastly refused to recognize their responsibility to deal with the rights of all people, including our people. We agree in that. So therefore, you're at an impasse where you've got aboriginal rights uh, imprecisely spelled out in the charter and governments that won't talk to you about them. Isn't that correct? They haven't wanted to talk about them to date. And you, therefore, are going to stop as in Lyle Island. Ten years ago. No, I'm, I'm not trying to harass you. I'm trying to make it clear to but me. But you've you got to look at the, the, like you say, the real practical, clear That's picture. That's a practical, you've clear You've got to open up your eyes and look at it also. My eyes are open. Now. All I've been hearing from the media, from you, and all of these other people over the past few weeks is trying to inflame this confrontation, this, this alleged confrontation between the Haida and the logging community. Nothing could be further from the truth. What do you mean truth. alleged confrontation? I mean, don't give me double talk, Miles. No, I'm not. A, there, there, was, there was no need for any confrontation. Who stopped it? Our, Who stopped they it? had implemented their resolution. That's, that's, this resolution is Which what I resolution? The Jimmy, social credit resolution. Hold that a second, Jimmy, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. I'm glad we have a lot of time this yeah, morning. I think you're going astray yourself. We should have been talking about this to begin with. This no. is a promise made by the government by to our people. Which government? The social credit government. It says right on there. Did you vote for them? I voted at that year when it was made promise what to us year 10 years made? ago. 1975? 1975. I know, I yeah. talked about that yesterday, yeah. pointed it yeah. out. Well, this is the document we're talking about. And you're going to try and get Bennett it, to keep it, his word on that? Well, we're going to see whether he's got forked tongues or not. What do you think? Well, we'll, we'll see. We've, we've sent him a letter, we've asked him, a telex, we've asked him to meet with him to discuss this very resolution. You're not being practical. It's up, it's up to Bennett to answer. He's, he's the guy that's on the hot spot, not the Indians. That's what I said yesterday. Yeah. If he came out now and said he would Should, negotiate with you, correct, it would correct. defuse the whole yeah, thing, th This it? is his promise. This is his promise not only to the Nisca people, to all the Indians in British Columbia, 10 years ago. Hold it back. After the break. <laughs> This is their turn on the air to say their piece. My piece has been perfectly straightforward. I went up there, I want you to get this, Jimmy, when the logging camp was being closed down because the IWA pointed it out to me, because we can't afford to lose any jobs in British Columbia at this moment, especially with all this uh, environment people in the East who know nothing about the economic position in British Columbia. 
and my hands are clean, I said, keep on logging. The government issued the cutting permits. The moment the government issued the cutting permits, Miles and the council decided to stop it. That's your God-given right. If that same government had kept its word in the first place, there wouldn't have been no squabble the way it's going right now. All right. When they did, did not. They did not keep the the stem resolution they made. You you trade on there. All right. You you tell me. During during, during the campaign of, of 1970, 1975, our council decided to meet Premier Bennett in Terrace in the in the Sumber Lodge Motel. At that time, I asked Mr. Bennett, if your party wins this election, Mr. Bennett, what have you got for Indian people on your platform? You know what he said? This is what he said. Whereas the following principle must be party policy because this is, in fact, a party of people, all people. Whereas we in this social credit party must always keep in mind that the broadest concept of united people is most essential and vital and it must include all races, all creeds, and all British Columbia. Therefore, be it resolved that we in this party must make policy that will, A, listen to this, re recognize and rectify wrongs of the past and present grievance of the native people of British Columbia. B, we must encourage, look at this, we must encourage and formulate a mechanism where actual negotiation will take place between the Indian <coughs> people the province of British Columbia and the federal government. C, we must inform the general public of British Columbia that after negotiating and arriving at a just settlement, the compensation agreed upon will derive from the production, extraction, and export of this province's natural resources and will compensate, and compensation will not be from taxpayers' pocket. D, this party will extend to the native people all those services, benefits, and privileges that the general public, other than the native Indian people, enjoy. These will include services, assistance in education, hospital insurance benefit, agriculture, bank interest, assistance to private business, as well as to corporations or company, and incentives and assistance in planning and implementing economic growth that will directly assist native Indian people of British Columbia. E. In the area of, quote, fish, wildlife, and conservation, unquote, this party will respect the traditional hunting and fishing ground of the native Indian people of British Columbia. And we will further respect the manner and means of procuring the natural food as done by the native Indian people. Be it further resolved that at all times the objective of this social credit party will be to encourage and not restrict self-help development of the native people of British Columbia. This resolution is passed unanimously at the 1975 Convention of the Social Credit Party Re-Indian and Land Settlement and Indian Affairs in British Columbia. Okay, hold it a second. Just a minute, I'm not finished yeah. yet. Who gave no, it? No. Bill Bennett was campaigning in Terrace when I asked him whether he had on the platform for Indian. That's when Bill Bennett hand me this resolution. And following that, he won the election. He won the election on the 11th of December, and he delegated Alan Williams to come to New Ianch with, along with Judd McCannon. And I'll read you further the opening remarks of Alan Williams. Take a minute. I'm not finished Take yet. Take a minute. I'm not finished yet. Alan Williams said, the letter of invitation from your distinguished president received after the December 11th election asked the government of British Columbia, which is my pleasure to represent, listen, to come as a third party in the land settlement negotiation. Those were his opening remarks and blah, 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 all the way down to this negotiation. Right. Ten years later, now they're going to put Indians in jail. What the heck are they going to do about their promise? To us, you know, this is, a, you know, they breached their, their word. They promised to us, you know, especially Bill Bennett, because Bill Bennett handed me this resolution himself in Terrace, in the Slumber Lodge Motel in November 1975. Now, 10 years later, look at, look at, looks like they're going to put all the Haida people in jail now. Now, they better build bigger jails because British Columbia is fast becoming the South Africa of Canada. You better believe it. This is what the pu public knows, that. No, that's well mm. said, and it had to be said, and it's time it was said, because in 75, Alan Williams did promise to negotiate with the Indians. Now, don't confuse the situation in Lyle Island with that particular piece of double cloth. I am saying if they had kept their word, there wouldn't have been no Mears Island, no double, the Lyle Island, there's another valley too, where is it? Stein, Stein Valley. Stein Valley, and there's going to be more of it to come. 
Well said, James Gosnell of the Nishka Tribal Council. Back after the break. I think I can state safely that the ball has been passed very effectively to Mr. Bennett's court, but to keep the thing within the proper reflection, remember that the law has moved into Lyle Island, the white man's law if you want to say that, and has said that the logging must be allowed to proceed. Mr. Richardson tells me that they've taken the action on Lyle Island because of the overall injustices to the Haida Nation. Is that correct? And to the Aboriginal people in general. That, that we're people in this country. We're people in our homelands. And we're what? entitled to justice just like everyone else. It can't continually be denied. What? There are no treaties, of course, in British Columbia. And this will be, uh, this will be thrown in your face in the court actions to come. What you have is protection of existing Aboriginal rights in the Charter, is that correct? There, right, there are no treaties. There are certainly no treaties with the Haida Nation. You talked about double talk a little while ago in terms of what I was telling you. I want to tell you about some double talk. That It's true that there's never been an agreement between the Haida Nation and the, and the Canadian people, either federal or provincial government. And if there, if there has been, I'd like to see proof of that. We've never seen that to date. No. And I want you to understand that the decision that our people have, are having to make right now about, as you call, breaking the law, is not a decision that's lightly taken. Our people have been very law-abiding, respectful people who have tried, bent over backwards to get along good with everyone that shares our lands with us. And I can say that without any doubt in my mind. We've tried every avenue that's available to us. We've tried the political route, we've tried planning processes, we've tried the courts. And I think the legal basis of what we're saying in this country and the Canadian Federation is very clear. Uh, Thomas Berger explained that to you very clearly the other day. The judge in, the, in this South Moresby injunction hearing in the Mears Island case has stated very clearly that this is not an issue for the courts, it's a political issue and it must be dealt with. And we've tried. If you look at, the, if you look at the, the history of suppression of Native peoples through legislation in, in, throughout history, you know, it was only, it was only th a few years ago that Native people even had the right to vote. It was our potlatches, 19, the basis of our culture well, were, your were outlawed. Were in 1949, the you got the, the right to vote. The, the Preemption Act, which, which allowed only lands to be handed over to British subjects. Native people were not, were not uh, subject to that. And now we come to the court cases, the, the famous Mears Island case and the Kitsan Wet'suwet'en case. The, the, at the same time as the provincial government is accusing us of breaking the law, they're, they're running the argument in that case. And Judge Gibbs said it in the Mears case, and it's been stated continually as a basis of their position that the natives are sleeping on their rights, they call it, that we have not actively defended them, therefore they don't exist. That's what I call well, hypocrisy. Let me, let, I agree with you, but let me, and the, the judge in the injunction case said this was a matter for political settlement too, and he was right to center Bennett on it. Bennett is the man who promised in 1975 to negotiate all the troubles and, as you said, and I said, did not deliver any profit. And what, but to be practical, what Bennett will tell you right now, if he were here, is because the Social Credit Convention passed a resolution I'm, I'm aware of that. does not mean that the but government don't is going forget, to carry don't it out. Don't forget that the there's no government without grassroots, and, and this resolution is a Social Credit Party grassroots thinking. Right. Are you telling me if there's a government that's got no grassroots? If the government hasn't got any grassroots, how could it be a government in the first place? Agreed. What you're telling me is that every native Indian in British Columbia will vote against Bennett for now and forevermore. We're not talking about vote. It doesn't make any difference, Jack, who wins the next election. This, this problem will not disappear. Don't kid yourself. Let me put a proposition to you. This country is ruled by, what shall we call, non-Indian laws. Correct? Mm -hmm. If I am enjoined from not doing something, I must obey the law and go to jail, correct? Right, under the principles of Canadian democracy, that's true. Under the principles which of is, the laws we have. I is, obey the law and I go to jail. Are you prepared to take the consequences of what Jimmy says is going to happen? I ex explained it to you very clearly that the decision that our people have made, we know our place in our homelands. 
Every one of our person no wakes up every morning knowing that they're on Haida land. Wherever they are in the world, they know that those Queen Charlotte Islands are Haida land. Next question. That's, it's when we come up against un injustices like this, it's a very important decision that, that these are people who, are, who have been bent over backwards to be respectful of the law have to make. But the lands, seas, and resources are the basis of our survival as a people, and we have to do something. Uh, in other words, you're not telling me, are you, that you want the whole of the Queen Charlotte. You're prepared to negotiate for your land claims on the Queen Charlotte. We're prepared to negotiate the basis of coexistence with all people. Based on right. title. And you have to remember that we're all in the same boat. Yeah, but you got to watch you don't whip up, that you are capable of whipping up things. I said to you very carefully, you're prepared to negotiate with the government for land claims on the Queen Charlotte, are you? Yes, we've been prepared for well, over years. British Columbia is prepared to negotiate and coexist and share the whole, whole, whole province. I'll come back at you again in a minute, Jimmy, but just let me finish this because he'll accuse me of misquoting him if I don't understand them properly. The South Moresby Park, where do you stand on the environmental groups on the Moresby Park? Do you want that ceded now as a national park before the land claims are settled? The Haida Nation has never ever stated that we wanted a park. We, we want those lands, the integrity of those lands to remain. We want the, the values in those lands to remain intact. In the long run, the, for long term stability in the Canadian political system, we have to resolve the, what you call the land well, claim. See what the, we'll, we'll take a break and then I'll come to you what the, what, what the average non-Indian says in the pub. Because you've got to face the attitude okay, of the sure. non-Indian in the pub. You know it as well as I do. Well, that's what I figure we're doing right now. Not yet. After the break. <laughs> I think this is one of the toughest interview sessions I have ever had on this program. And I was just saying to Miles Richardson and to Jimmy Gosnell, Haida and Nishka, of the areas, you've got to face the attitude of industry and unions in British Columbia. Now, you know how Jack Monroe stands. Jack Monroe wants to continue TFL 24 logging because there are 18,000 guys gone from the industry. Now, you're stopping people from working at the moment. Is that fair today? Where is he going to go? He's only got 20 more years to log in this province. Where is he going to go for his timber? Why haven't they done anything in the forest industry? You, you're talking about forest uh, industry. Don't give me the old Bennett line that it's yeah. all the fault of somebody else. I'm talking about jobs right now. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's jobs, it's jobs. And you know the resentment caused when you, if you stop people going to work, right? Yes, it's um, very unfortunate. We've tried very hard to avoid that. You have not. We have. We over the past 12 years, well, over the intensively years. over the past six years in terms of we're, the South We're about Morris 80 to 90 percent unemployed ourselves. Maybe from the day we were born, we're unemployed, Jack. If you live to be 10 years or 100 years, you're still unemployed. Just because a few people now is going to be unemployed, looks like sound like the world's going to come to an end. All right, Holy suppose, God, suppose we would have been unemployed for 100 years. Let me ask. What you is the government going to do about it? Double talk. Yeah, that's all they've been doing. It's not even double talk. They're doing absolutely nothing about it. Mind the Indians haven't yeah. done much to help themselves. Well, that's, in the last that's, that's, years. The that's the reason why we're promoting the third order of government because nobody's going to do it but except us. And this is exactly what Nisca Tribal Council is attempting to do: and is to create jobs for ourselves. And you're quite prepared. And these governments, especially the Bennett government, will not even talk to us. And you're quite prepared to go against the law and the establishment to demand our. We're not talking inflamed. about going against the law, Jack. We're talking about. On the honorable survival. That's what we're talking about. Don't lead me into laws. No. Why not? We live by the laws. I know we do. Why can't you live by we, the we laws? Been, we've been law abiding for 100 years. Now, if you got the Haida land settlement, would you sell it back to us as a park or would you log it? Well, we'd have to sit down at the Negotiate table and talk about, about that. That's exactly yeah. what we're That's what trying to do. That's what going to no, be all about. You know. Nobody ever said that it was going to be easy to. to sit down and deal with this but we're never going to deal with it until we sit down and address it and it's it might 
take some time. I think that's what we've got to talk about. And you're quite prepared to stop development in the Charlottes in the meantime. Are you going to stop the logging up in, in, on Graham Island? We've, right now we're working on, on three basic priorities, and this is just short-term priorities. There's the South Moresby area, an area that's been defined as Dugoose Tribal Park, and the intertidal zone of, of our, around the entire islands. What's so the those, those are just working for... Okay, so you're going to continue to disobey the law on Lyle. That's one thing, correct? The decision that our people had made based on our very legitimate constitutional rights is being upheld right now. Uh, that's a very roundabout way of saying you're going to defy the Supreme Court injunction, Did isn't you? it? Did you hear the judge in the Supreme Court case when he addressed that injunction? When he stated very clearly that this, these issues are issues that are for the political forum. These are issues of justice. The law, the framework for law is, is, a, is a framework that's, that's designed to, to provide a uh, uh, mechanism to bring about justice. Well, Nobody I'm, ever says that that's justice itself. But the, but same the basic judge. thing that we have to entrench into those laws is, is the rights and the place of our people in the, in the framework that, of this country. That's all taken, that's all given, the understanding of it. But when the judge told you it was a political process, he did not give you carte blanche to defy the law. And therefore you'll take the consequences well, the, of the that. The judge couldn't do that and like I said, it put our people in a very difficult position. That uh, would, that's a decision that is not taken lightly on how much you can stand how by many, how many and have, you have your rights and the survival of your culture being jeopardized. How many hiders are you going to shortcut the normal political process by direct confrontation? Now, that's a correct interpretation of what you say. Our people are out there protecting our lands. But wouldn't you agree with me that you're going to shortcut with the best motives in the world the political route to go in direct confrontation against the law? We're prepared to go into the political route at any time, and we're in that right now. But laws you know, are made to be broken, you know? Who said we, that, you know? Laws are made to be broken. Tell me what law that hasn't been broken anywhere in Canada, or I anywhere in the world, for that matter. You know? I don't break laws that send you, you know, to you jail. You know, if, if, there, if there's laws uh, just suppressing people, like what's happening to the Indian people, it must be a hell of a damn hell of a law. It has to be changed, you know? That's why these laws, that's what's suppressing the hide to They beckon them into the corner, they're going to push them in jail and do everything that they want with them. If now, I, what kind of law is that? Look, if I have See? to obey the law, he has to obey the law. Well, if, if Queen Charlotte Island was yours, I, I, I'd bet you you'd have been the worst guy on that line right well, now. I, have, I probably yeah. would have been, well, sure but I would, have been. I would say quite clearly yeah. I'm going to defy the law and take the consequences. Well, that's exactly what these people are doing. They, they have no choice. Let's go to the forms. But I think before we go to the forms, we just do a little sum up. The existing Aboriginal rights for all Native peoples are guaranteed in the Charter. There is a Supreme Court injunction which says the loggers are to be allowed to work on Lyle Island. Decision of the elders of the Haida Nation are that they will blockade the road on Lyle Island. Jimmy Gosnell has put out a challenge to Premier Bennett that he, Bennett, has broken his promise and his Attorney General's promise of 1975 to negotiate all these matters you read out. Am correct. I correct? Correct. And you want Bennett to do what today? Carry out his promise, not only to the Nisca people, to all the people in, in British Columbia. Could Live up to his word. Couldn't be done no overnight. No false tongues Could've. about it, you know. If Bennett gave you a date for negotiations to begin in good faith, would that mollify you? I think it would give our people a, a sense of optimism that isn't there now. That that there is some some rational, respectful process that we can sit down and deal with these issues well, because I, they have to be dealt with. I think that puts it in a nutshell that if Bennett or his Attorney General said we will sit down and negotiate January the 1st or July the 15th, 1986 in a real way on land rights, it would defuse this situation and give us all a breathing spell. Correct. 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 You see, in, 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 that, in that second 
part of their resolution, they said, we must encourage and formulate a mechanism where actual negotiation will take place between the Indian people, the province of British Columbia, and the federal government. Now, if they were to put that forward, that will put at, at least try and diffuse what's going on in Lyle Island. And just for the purpose of the boys in Victoria, do you agree with that situation? This, the decision that our people had made in light of the development of the politics and the legal aspects to date, and the, in terms of the state of our islands, the lands and the resources on them, is that there is to be no logging in that area. That's a, de that's a decision that what's going on now is based upon. But, but if, there, if he said he would negotiate, would that not mollify you and defuse it for a breathing spell? Well, if, if he said that he was, would negotiate, we have to sit down with him and talk about what he means and sit down and talk about how we could properly approach this issue. Your questions after the break. <laughs> We're going to calls now to um, Miles Richardson, Haida Council, and James Gosnell, Nishka. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, Mr. Webster, I don't agree with your guests. And I'll tell you why. Go I on. think that those lands belong to everybody. And as such, that everybody should have a say in, in, uh, in what happens to them. Not, not just the loggers and not just the Indians, but everybody all human beings, period. And I don't think that they should be cut down. I don't think that man has the right to go in and impact his presence on every piece of land that he ever wants to get set foot on. Fair enough. Any comment on that? Or would you roughly agree with him? Well, does he agree, with the, agree with, does he agree with the laws and the principles of this country? I'm sorry. His laws are made by people in power. People in power sometimes, as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Bennett made, uh, as the example just brought up, made some promises in 1975. Those promises, I'm sure, were one of the tools that he used to get elected. In 1985, he decides that those promises are no longer need to be kept. In the meantime, laws have been made based on his his uh, being in power. He was put in power uh, on a falsehood because okay. he broke, the, uh, uh, he's a, he's uh, he broke those the promises he made. Then, as far as I'm concerned, the rules that he made, if they're applicable to this situation, are also false. Thank you. You know, that's that's an important thing that a lot of people put forth you know you, we've got to realize that we are all in the same boat here yeah. that all the people that are yeah. here depend on these and lands and resources on what he said there. and that and that all on the same boat business our, our canoes rotting you better face it look, look at that car deal that's going to going to Quebec they didn't just well I don't tell you what about that far yeah. you, you won't even obey the laws of this land why worry about the Quebec but Jack what We're we have what, what we have now. to you, do you don't get the point in, in relation to that is to sit down. Nobody's going to invest in this country the way, the way this whole thing is going. Nobody's Nobody. going to invest either no. with all the Indian land claims yeah. hanging over the forest lands of BC. That's correct? exactly yeah. what I'm telling you. And they're having a hell of a time getting money from Wall Street too. Would you, you, know, let, that, Miles, yeah. would you let Miles have a word, please? <laughs> what we have to do is sit down and negotiate how we're going to coexist on these lands as as mutually respecting human beings. And one, one, of, the, one of the basic issues that, that would be on the table in, in, in these discussions, and I'm sh they, they're out in the political process at all times, is that we must, we must redefine our concepts of development of those lands and resources so that respect and justice can be accorded to all people. We could close down all the forests of British Columbia tomorrow and the world wouldn't miss them and we'd all go on welfare. Well, you could keep your head in the sand you know, and say well, that. Why don't no, we just... Nobody can close that down, Jack. Come down to earth. Let's talk this thing. Nobody's going to close down anything in British Columbia. Even if the Indians have been saying it for 100 years, nothing is closed down. Go ahead, What are you please. talking about? Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Jack, I'm Anishka. Please don't cut me off as what I have to say is rel relevant to our self-determination as the Aborig Aborigines of Canada. Jack, I would like to direct my comments to you. I think you have forgotten that you as a Scotchman, fighting the, the Scotland has been fighting the English for centuries and that your motherland has been fighting for their land rights, their culture rights, their language rights, self-determination and sovereignty. We as a nation of Aborigines of our motherland, Canada, and B.C. feel the same way as the Scottish, the Welsh, the I Irish, and the South Africans to self-determination. You're a hypocrite, Jack. Too bad this program couldn't be heard in Scotland and Wales and Ireland and the other parts of the world for, for who, who are 
uh, fighting for self-determination. Dear madam, I am not a Scottish nationalist, nor was I ever, nor will I ever be. I am a homogenized Scotchman who came to Canada and became hopefully a homogenized Canadian 38 years ago, and I am not a hypocrite, and I won't take that even from a Nishka woman. <laughs> you wouldn't take it either, Jimmy. <laughs> Go ahead from Castle Guy. Yes, Mr. Webster. Yes. I'd uh, just like to give my full support to your two guests. Uh, I believe the uh, previous caller made it an excellent uh, point uh, in that the uh, intrinsic values uh, cannot be uh, put aside. You know, they're going to keep servicing. And I am very surprised that you have not had the government on the hot seat on this issue far sooner. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon not only the native people, but the loggers and all British Columbians to ensure that the government deals with land claim issues. I have not interviewed Premier Bennett for more than a year because Premier Bennett does not want to come on the program in Vancouver because there are questions like this that he does not want to answer to a fairly large section of the public in British Columbia. And I hereby repeat my invitation, and I'm not getting big in the heat, repeat my invitation to Premier Bennett. He can have any time he wants to come on this program and talk not just about land claims, but other matters vital to the economy of British Columbia, which is having its worst winter since the dirty 30s. Fair enough, sir. How much we got there? Two minutes. Go ahead to my guests. Mr. Gosnell. Yep. Mr. Richardson. Yep. Do you have any idea of the pride and the happiness your fellow Canadians feel when they hear you speak? I am of English-German extraction. A friend of mine is of Chinese-Canadian extraction. When we heard Mr. Gosnell speak, we phoned each other. Our lines were busy. We had to wait. We phoned back and we said, did you hear that? Finally, maybe something's going to happen. Men, keep up the good work, men. There Thank are people who are behind you. Thank you very kindly. Thank I appreciate you. that comment. Go ahead, please. Yes, if uh, this 1975 agreement with the Silk Reds, if that is valid, how can they get a court order to stop this agreement? Well, now, don't be simple-minded. It's a 1975 political promise which was delivered at a later stage at New Ianch by Alan Williams, then the Attorney General. That's got no relation whatsoever to the laws of the land. It is a political promise. Am I right, Jimmy? That's the way it appears to be. <laughs> so you mean to tell policy. me any agreement that I political made with policy. Mr. Bennett in 1985, 10 years later, they can just be overruled and so is... His agreement isn't worth the paper it's written on. He pol no political promise is worth the paper it's written on or the, or the verbal utterings of it. It's got no validity in law. Go ahead, please, to Messrs. Richardson and Gosnell. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Miles and Jimmy. Miles, I met you a few years ago. Uh, about five years ago, you gave me a lift, and uh, you were fighting the same thing you're fighting now. I'd just like to ask a couple of questions and hang up and listen to your answer. Go on. I'd like to know uh, how long the uh, native people have been on Lyle Island and from, you know, before, and if this fight continues uh, for the whole encringement of the, the Charlottes under the native people uh, fighting for it, uh, is it, is it basically the Charlottes that you want or is it the Stein Valley and all that? And did you know for fact, true fact, that Bill Bennett and his family made their money from the Hoorah? There's always an idiot who calls in. His uh, answers to the two questions are quite simple. One, you lived there since time immemorial, and you, you're prepared to sit down and discuss land. Yeah, well, our, that, that's an important place for our people throughout history. The, the, as a matter of fact, the place that our camp is on right now is an old village site. Fair and, and until when the, when the smallpox hit and decimated our populations down to the low of about 500 people, everybody moved into two villages and skidded it and... And massive. How many in the Hyde Council now? About between five and six thousand. More after the break. <laughs> Go ahead to Gosnell and Richardson, Nishka Haida. Yeah, Jack. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm a white person and I totally support their position on the land claims. And it seems you get a lot of calls from us people this morning. 
And the reason I'm calling, I've called you before on this, saying that, you know, the true, uh, what we call environmental radicals are probably our environmentalists, the people who are looking out for the interests of Canadians. Now, these, the Haida people live in that area, the Nishka people live in that area, and they're fighting for the right to, to see that those lands are taken care of, okay? Have you a question? Have I heard a question? No, I'm making a statement on their support, and that's all I guess I have to say on it, Jack. Much obliged. I moved them along quickly so we get a variation, otherwise some will go on for 20 minutes, yeah. like Jimmy. Go ahead, please. My question is, Jack, uh, should the thousands of native people in British Columbia band together and go to Isle Island in support of the Haida Nation stand, would they all be foolishly arrested? That's what the Attorney you. General said. Is he asking you? Yes, if they break the law, they're entitled to be arrested, and especially if they're cited for criminal contempt of a court order, which is one of the sacrosanct bases of our system of laws. Whether or not you think they're just, they are our, uh, whether Sven Robinson does, did a white swan, they are the law. That's what the law is. Obviously, politicians must act to defuse such potentially dangerous situations which is why I'm hopeful that the reminder given to Mr. Bennett by the inimitable Mr. Gosnell might have some effect on the people around Mr. Bennett as advisors. Yeah, Jack, did you get that point about the hypocrisy of the laws in terms of the legislative suppression of the native people throughout, throughout history and the situation that exists now where, where the Attorney General and the, the people that he's working with are asserting in court in, in the highest courts in this country that, that um, if Native people don't protect their rights, their legitimate rights, that they're sleeping on them and therefore for, by some work mechanism of the law that they don't exist. I do not believe that there are many Canadians in British Columbia today, such as myself, who feel that they have taken an active part in the legislative oppression of British Columbians. I have been here long enough to know about the fact that you didn't have the vote until I think it was Wismer gave you the vote in 1949, and that was, of course, in its own way shameful. But you might won't find many of today's British Columbians with a guilt complex. Uh, many of them think we all live in the same society under the same laws. But, well, but I'm just trying to make the point of what the, see what, the point of you how made. the so kids that the government is hiding behind those laws. The, the highest court in this province, the BC Court of Appeal suggested very strongly to them that that this issue must be dealt with politically what do they do they appeal it through the courts when right. when it's when we could have sat down at any time and began this process you've been slow about it though haven't you it wasn't until i went up there and started the demand for jobs on lyle island that you actually began to take action on lyle island correct oh, we made that decision years ago it's just that it's come down to that area because you thought the camp was going to be closed down, and then it wasn't, right? Well, we went through a long process of trying to work this out so that everybody, the politicians included, could come out of it looking good. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, could you please tell me, are there any hiders who are their living by logging in the Charlottes? And if so, how is this current controversy uh, affecting their livelihood? There's a lot of hiders that earn their living on the Charlottes, and there's a lot of hiders who intend to continue at the rate that the forests on those islands are going to be managed, that's not a long-term possibility, that those forests are coming very close to, to not being economically viable. They threw out that concept of sustained yield years ago. Well, that's not correct about TFL 24. That's just not correct, I hate to tell you. What's not correct? That they threw out the concept of sustained yield years ago. Do you know the concept of TFLs? What yes. I'm talking about is the Queen Charlotte Islands as an economic unit, as our people have treated it for thousands which of years. And, the Graham Island, of course, has long been logged. Mac and Blow and Crown are still logging up there. Or they've oh. had big logging operations there. On no. South Moresby, there is one ma major logging operation. The only one at the moment is on Lyle at this minute, right? Well, you've got to remember how the TFLs and that sustained yield process work. That 37% of TFL 24 is on, on the Queen Charlotte Islands right now. That they have to manage their whole tree farm license on that basis. They so theoretically, if in a time, of, if in a cyclical downturn of the industry as, as it's in now, they could theoretically log off those forests while maintaining that balance in the other parts of their TFL. I don't think that's the issue today. Go ahead, but please. But it's, 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 it's important information. They say they're going to log half of 1% of 
of the 110 square miles for each of 45 years. But I know what you're saying about the uh, industry downcline, which the can whole affect policy, the country. The rip-off policy. That's what. Go ahead. Is. Oh, just one second, please. Hold. Now, go ahead, please. Yeah, we're talking about the Indians breaking the law and the government who doesn't respond to their land claims. But I haven't heard you talk a bit today about the logging companies who have decimated the forest for 80 years and not put any of their profits back into the forest Fair to down. keep them alive Fair so we don't have any of these problems. Yeah, yeah. Fair yeah. enough. There have been all kinds of scandals and mismanagement in the forest industry of British Columbia, but that's something that's going to have to be corrected on a political basis by a government of your choice if you bother even to get out and vote. Prince Rupert, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd just like to say, Jack, as a follower on the Charlotte, that uh, I totally support uh, Buddy and the Nishka tribe and what they're trying to do. And if you were to spend more than a couple of days up there, you could probably see yourself how much they've uh, logged off and the rate at which they're logging up there. Fair enough. Thank you very much. We're just about out of time. Good program this morning. Brought forth some frank discussion and comment. And I'm quite convinced that a videotape will have been made of your statement to Premier Bennett, and who knows, he might even respond to it. What's your move now? You're holding a press conference in Victoria today? Yep, yep. What time? One o'clock. One o'clock. Now, on this, this morning, there was, the loggers went to work on Lyle Island, and Mark Schneider didn't know why your people didn't appear. Do you know why they didn't appear? Well, I'm here talking to you. I'm not on Lyle Island. You'd have to... Will you be back blockading the road tomorrow if the decision of your council, is the decision of your council going to continue to be carried out? I'm sure that's a possibility. I, you know, ev every one of our people has to make that decision for themselves. You're not but telling it's me a, you're going to call it off, are you? You're not telling me you're going to call it off. It would be my feeling that it wouldn't be by any means. Don't you know? It's my feeling that it wouldn't be. Fair enough. But a sincere thanks to Jimmy Gosnell of Nishka and to Miles Richardson of the Haida Nations. I'll be back after the break. Tomorrow, we will have some Liberal MPs on tomorrow because the whole of the Liberal caucus is meeting in Vancouver. And I'm aiming for what was rudely called the Rat Pack, two of whom are Sheila Copps and John Nunziata. Um, so we'll have a bash at the Liberals tomorrow, and they're going to have a bash at the Tories, I suppose, at 9 a.m. precisely. Mm -hmm.